All right, so I'm going to just look at, uh, for a quick second at what we talked about last week. And I tried to tie it back to Genesis just so we don't forget what the first sin was. And often as a pastor for 22 years now, going on 23 years here, but my wife and I served as elders for 17 years together prior to coming out here. So, you know, when you, when you take on the role of, of the senior pastor and the founder, the buck stops at your desk. And people ask some very difficult questions because there are some very difficult questions. Like, why do bad things happen to good people? And they forget that there's a devil. <laughs> and they blame things on God that should be blamed on the devil. And that's one of the common things you hear is the best lie the devil ever said is that he doesn't exist. And people don't even believe in him because he's convinced them that it's not true. But everybody knows in their heart that there is such a thing as evil. They just don't know that there's also such a thing as good. But if there's evil, there's got to be good. Nobody denies that there's evil in the world, right? So I love this picture because when we sin, we hide ourselves. And we're really good at hiding ourselves behind these masks. But this girl's face is covered and she's going about her life because she's ashamed of something that happened. And if we just look at humanity, this is all of us. We have something inside of us that knows when we compromise something that we don't believe. And we're, we say it all the time, we're human, we're not perfect, we make mistakes. But what we don't know if we're not Christians is that we're forgiven. And that when we come to him and we ask him for forgiveness, doesn't mean you'll never make a mistake, but he gives you tools to walk and be more like him and to be converted into his character, to be transformed. The old thing dies off and the chaff gets burned out and the silver, like in the Old Testament, turn up the heat and the fire brings all the impurities up to the surface. And it's not that they're not ugly, but they can be ejected. They can be taken out of our lives. We can be purified. We can detox in the spirit through the truth of the word, through the power of the spirit, but also by being in a healthy body of believers. Sorry, yeah, I'm the pastor, so of course I'm going to say that, but if there was ever a time that we should appreciate each other, it's coming out of two years plus of COVID, right? Like, man, we are not meant to be alone. We're meant to be in relationship and covenant relationship, accountability with each other. I trust you, Dave Torres. If you see something in me, even though I signed your paycheck, <laughs> be brave. Speak the truth in love, right? Because I want people speaking into my life. I'm, you know, when you're surrounded by prophets, they'll tell you what they think, and they don't apologize for telling you what they think. It's all right. You'd rather have that. You'd rather have that. So resist the fleeting pleasures of sin because it looks like it's... For a season, yes, it's pleasurable. Of course, we all know the devil's good at his job. He's a good liar. He's the father of lies. So that, that seduction process is very hard to fight, but we have to fight it because it brings conception, and that, when it's fully grown, it says brings death. And that's what happened in the garden, right? And we looked at that verse in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says, when, when Eve ate the fruit off of the tree, their eyes were open. And the devil had lied to them and said that they would die. She said, well, we didn't die. We ate it, and we didn't die. You're hot, too? Oh, good. I got, a, I got an amen here. Anybody else hot? Turn, turn the air. Come on, let's get the air cooler in here. Rich Gaglio's running now. <laughs> and I never got my fan up here, whoever's up in the booth. <laughs> Can we go into HR for that one? <laughs> So it's perfect communion in the garden with Adam and Eve, with the Father. No shame, no lie, perfect truth. That's God's intention for all of us. So one mistake of believing that lie of the enemy and that we inherited that sin. And, and the ultimate truth I think that we should try to take out of that is we think we can handle the knowledge of good and evil. That we're better than God because he said, no, I don't want you. Trust me, you don't need to know that one. All these other trees you can have. Tree of life. But learn how to trust me, even if you don't fully understand it. Trust me to be obedient to what I say. You don't need to go to that one. Well, but you're trying to hold something out on me. And for thousands of years, everybody thinks, you have that problem, but I can handle it which is pride. And we think we're smarter than God. We're not. Look at somebody say we're not. 
you're really smart, but you're not smarter than God. <laughs> so just be obedient. <laughs> just be obedient, Einstein. The, Einstein's not smarter than God. Nobody is. So we're just going to obey him. Yes, there's different ways that you can interpret the Bible. Okay, we'll go there another day. But let's just get it right down in the middle. He told us not to do this. We did it, and nobody gets it right after they sin. And then we were born with this sin, so we have to be born again into the spirit and into the truth so we get that second chance. But how many know he's more than the second chance? He's the 2,000th chance. And no matter how many times you made a mistake, no sin is too far away from God to bring redemption. Man, that's a good piece of news right there. So this girl, I, I'm tying it back to the New Testament now because Jesus had to come and live this sinless life, fully tempted just like we are, 33 years, not one sin. Amazing. He could have sinned. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a temptation. But because he's obedient and he doesn't think that he has the ability to be out to be smarter than God. He's just obeying his father. I only do what I see my father doing and hear, and I only follow his instructions only. We have to do the same thing, but it's hard, isn't it? So he lives a sinless life. He goes to the cross as a penalty for our sins, and then he's resurrected three days later. And when he's on the cross, he says, it is finished. And what was finished, one way you could look at this is, all those centuries and eons of living with that death sentence that came in the garden is now done. Adam was brought out of the earth by God, but sin, Jesus came and lived the whole life and never sinned. So why couldn't death hold him? Because the wages of sin is death. If you never sin, death can't hold you. He never sinned. So he gets resurrected, and now the Bible tells us the same spirit that raised him from the dead lives inside of you and me. It just hides sometimes. <laughs> Trying to keep it light here. So Jesus comes, and after the resurrection, he appears to people, and they don't recognize him. And one of the ladies that was at the cross with Jesus' mother, Mary, was also named Mary, and her husband was named Cleopas. And we read about this road to Emmaus, and two disciples are on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. And Jesus comes up alongside them, and they don't recognize him, even though they just saw him get crucified. But he's cloaked, because the truth is cloaked when we're living in a world of sin. Until our eyes are opened, unless you become born again, you cannot see the kingdom. And if you can't see it, you can't enter it. John chapter 3. But this kingdom is available to us if you say, not my will, yours be done, Lord. I take you as my Lord and Savior. So as he's walking along this road, he says, why are you guys so down? Like, wh why are you so depressed? And they look at him like, why are you the only person? Would you just land from Mars? If this was New Jersey, that's what they'd say. What are you, from Brooklyn? Kidding. Kidding. Just kidding. I got a lot of, lot of peeps here from Brooklyn, so I better be careful. <laughs> Oh, man, this is so profound. We know that Eve's eyes were open when she ate that fruit. They can't see him. They're, they take him to their house, husband and wife. It says two disciples, and people think it's two men. I don't think so. I think there's enough evidence in the Bible to say it was a husband and wife. That matters because Adam and Eve were a husband and wife that started this whole mess. And now he's going into a house of two of the disciples, and it says, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. And at the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened. See how beautiful the reversal of the curse. It's the reverse of all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And now we have the same decision we have to make. Don't think you can handle the knowledge of good and evil. Because that's how we get to a Supreme Court justice being asked a pretty basic question. Nothing against her, all right? I'm not criticizing the lady herself. She's a woman. And they ask her, can you give a definition of a woman? And she says, no, I'm not a biologist. That's a script. She lied on purpose to get the job. But that's not how the world's supposed to work when an infant knows the difference between a man and a woman. 
pre-verbal, you know the difference between a man and a woman because one of them feeds you. Stop it now, Pastor. Let's keep moving. It should really get you upset that your tax dollars are going to that curriculum to confuse people about gender, children about their gender. But what are we supposed to be? Like, oh, well, Christians are just supposed to get run over by the Mack truck. No, if we stand for truth, let's do something about it. Not a violent revolution. He, Jesus didn't promote violence. When Peter took his sword out and cut off the ear of Malchus, remember? Jesus just went, oh, you know, Peter, you're a hothead. And just <laughs> slaps it back on the guy's head. Why are we arresting this guy? We could shut down the hospitals. Amazing. And they still took him to the cross. So don't miss all of these connections in the New Testament. Mary sees Jesus in the garden and thinks he's the gardener. Well, Adam was told to tend the garden. This is the second Adam. There's all of these signs in there that it's a new dispensation. Not at the cross, at the resurrection. If he didn't raise from the dead, your faith is futile. He had to go to the cross but he's resurrected, and you have that same access to resurrection power, but you have to yield to it. So this girl is living in the normal shame of every other human being. She believed a guy, and, and he told her that he loved her, so she made herself available like she shouldn't have been, let's just say. That only happens about a billion times a year. People get tricked and lied to, and now she has to cover her shame. So they, we, mar we wear a mask. And, you know, Jesus was the first one to use the word hypocrite in, in the Old Testament days when they were crossing over into the New Testament as somebody wearing a mask. The way they used it in the Greek culture was for an actor in a play. You shall know the truth, and the truth will let you drop your mask. It'll set you free from trying to meet everybody else's expectations. Know your identity first as a child of God. Keep him happy and let the chips fall where they may. That's our goal. So then he takes us and he pulls all those fragments of all those pieces that sin caused us to break down and he puts it back together and now we live without the hands covering our face. That's the real you that's been waiting to come out of hiding because you have to believe that you're forgiven because half the time, Jane Hammond just gave a great message. And she said, we don't need the devil. We're so good at condemning ourselves, he can go work on somebody else. We curse ourselves. We speak about all the mistakes we make. But you're forgiven. But have you forgiven yourself? That's a good place to start. Look in the mirror and say, I forgive you. Yeah, because that's one of those ways the devil keeps a hook. Even though we're Christians. And let's just, you know, just say as a church, we believe that even though you're a Christian, you could still be oppressed by a demonic spirit. Not possessed, oppressed, all right? And it's not meant to be some, like, language thing here. It's not a workaround. But there's many Christians that said the prayer, they're ministry, in ministry, but they fall into sin. Does that mean they were never really a Christian? That's silly, isn't it? But it's kind of like this mindset that we think, well, once I'm a Christian, I'm not perfect. I'm going to make mistakes, and God won't take away my salvation, so at least I'm going to get into heaven when I die. That's a terrible way to think. We could aim much higher than just getting into heaven when we die. How about being a meat-eating Christian while we're here? <laughs> For such... The, for this purpose, the Son of Man, Son of God and Man was manifest that he might Destroy the works of the devil. That's Jesus. And then he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Go destroy the works of the devil. So then Paul brings out this dilemma. And in Romans chapter 7, I, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you know this verse. In, in Romans 7, 15, I wrote one translation down. And he sounds like he's a little bit of a, a split personality when he's talking about this, right? Not to make fun of that, but... He says, look, in, in Romans 7, 15, he says, I don't understand what I do. What I want to do, help me, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I end up doing. That's a problem. Can anybody relate? 
If you're not raising your hand, we'll call you out. Okay, you should all be able to relate to that. We'll get the camera on you if you're not lifting your hand up. No, we don't do that. Nope, we won't do that. But look, we just gotta be honest and stop hiding and just say, is there always gonna be more room for improvement to be more like Jesus? Say yes, always. Paul said, I have not yet arrived. Because he's the one that said this, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. So we like to call that my evil twin. <laughs> okay, I don't want to offend anybody, okay? I don't want to offend anybody. But I'm just saying, let's just be real. Let's just be honest. There's a part of us that doesn't want to obey the Lord. And we have to keep on throttling that thing for the rest of our lives. Paul said, I have not yet arrived. And he's pretty far along, wasn't he? So this isn't some, some embarrassing thing to have to mention. It's like, no, what do you do when the light in you is darkness? Confusing verse. How can light be darkness? Well, if you've ever been in that sinful world, you know what, what that is. There could be a dark anointing just like there's a bright anointing. Can't there? Yeah, that's what he's talking about. He says this in Matthew and then I just quoted Psalm 2 here. Why do the heathen rage? We're seeing a lot of rage in the culture, right? The, the media has learned how to push the rage buttons on both sides. And when you live in rage, your emotions are hijacked and you don't make good decisions. So let's just think about this, okay? I call, also call the purging darkness from our souls. That is not meant to be some kind of condemnation of anybody. This is start with the mirror. Let judgment begin where? in the house of the Lord, right here. If we can't be honest with ourselves and admit there still might be some dark sides to our personality, how are we gonna help the world, right? And it's all about truth. And, and you know, it's all inconvenient to somebody because if you wanna disobey the truth, you don't like the fact that God is asking you to go a certain way. All right, so this is how he said it. The lamp of the body is the eye, Matthew 6, 22. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. There it is, see? The light in you could be darkness. If you've given yourself over, well, I mean, lying is one way for sure. If therefore the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And that's why I said it, I called it, what do you do when the light in you is darkness? The first thing to answer that is don't run from it, face it, face it. God has given you revelation. He's showing something that can be brought to the cross. He said, pick up your cross daily. That means that there's always another thing that can go that's the chaff that needs to be burned off, but we don't live our lives under this intense microscope like, oh, I'm such a mess, I'm such a mess. No, you just live your life, and along the way, things just pop up, especially when you're driving. <laughs> That seems to be one of those real like places where the thing I want to do, I don't do, and the thing I don't want to do, I do. <laughs> so if you just back up a little bit, you know, a few verses prior to that, as, as an example, and there's many, this is the Sermon on the Mount, so awesome study, if you ever want to study Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, when you fast, wash your face and beautify yourself with oil, so no one who looks at you will know about your discipline. Say this word with me, motive. 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 Okay, so this is what he's going for now, is what is the reason why you're doing this? And, and here's a good formula. If you're trying to do it to impress people, you've aimed too low. You don't need the approval of man. You need the approval of God. But in order to feel good about ourselves, often we will look for the approval of man. How many likes did I get on Facebook? How many views did I get on a video that I put out there, right? This is all being distraction of us to be looking first, keep your mind set on the things above, not on the things of the earth, right? So this is the motive. When you, when you say you're gonna, when you're gonna take on a fast, don't tell anybody about it. In fact, go out of the way to make sure it doesn't look like you're this martyr who hasn't eaten in four days, and oh, I'm so holy, I just can't eat. Make it so that only your father who is unseen will see your fast. Nobody else has to know about it. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, do you believe that's true? Okay, you're nodding your heads. Nobody really shouted me out there, but that's okay. We should believe it's true because it's in the word and Jesus spoke it. 
and, and we don't always see the reward right away because I believe it's part of any good training that you have to do to be a disciple of something. You go through training, and God tests our heart. What's our motive? Why are you doing this? Are you doing it because you need a platform? And the only way you're going to feel good about yourself is if you get the applause of men? Problem. Problem. I heard one guy say, his father told him, don't seek an audience. Seek to have something to say. Seek the Lord for something to say. When you hear him, you'll get an audience. Good advice. Some people store up treasures in their homes here on earth like more Facebook lights <laughs> or more views on your video. This is short-sighted. Don't undertake this practice. Don't try to please men. Change your motive to please God, not men. Not easy. Instead, put up your treasures in heaven. And I'm just going to try to say, think of it more beyond money. That's how a lot of us have thought about this, make an investment in the kingdom. It's not that it doesn't mean that, but I think specifically here, he's going a little bit deeper under the surface of our heart. Maybe you'll believe me when I talk about it. Your treasures are in heaven, meaning I want everything that I love to be focused in the realm of the Father. I want my attention span to be always pulled in that direction, not to the distractions of the world. Instead, put your treasures up in heaven where moths don't attack it, where rust doesn't corrode it, and where thieves are barred at the door. Oh, I like that one. The thieves are barred at the door. They can't get beyond this security system. For where your treasure is, and I just put it in here, what you focus on is where your treasure is because that's the thing that has grabbed your attention. So in that moment, you're not focusing on God because something in the world became a false idol that was attractive to you. And if the devil can keep you away from focusing on God, it doesn't matter what it is on that big spectrum of, of distractions that he has as long as you're not focused on God. Sports for men, I don't know. It could be a real stronghold. They could tell you John 3.16 as the only verse they know because they saw it at the football game. <laughs> but they could go back 45 years and tell you the batting average of one of the players or, or how many yards a guy got in the Super Bowl from 1934. Like, there was no Super Bowl in 1934. You get my point? You're filling your brain with all this stuff, and guys like to talk about that, and, you know, ladies talk about other things. And I'm not saying don't ever watch a football game, but have your priorities. The Word is what's going to keep you from sinning. You got to know the truth if you want to be set free. It's only the truth you know that sets you free, not automatic. <laughs> where your treasure is, what you focus on, that's where your heart's going to be. And I just put it this way you value most that which captures your attention. So that's one way you can think about it. If you had a day off unexpectedly, you get a call and you don't have to come to work today, and here's 300 bucks, go do whatever you want to do today. What would you do? I hope it's not video games, okay? I'm just saying. I mean, that's chewing gum, okay? There's no nutrition. You go get stuck on an island, if all you got is chewing gum, you're going to die. You need to nourish yourself. You need something that's going to sustain you. And, you know, go ahead and play a video game once in a while. But if that's your focus, like, that's a problem. See, that's my evil twin. He wants to just go do the distracting stuff. He likes chewing gum. But no, sorry for anybody here who makes chewing gum, but <laughs> we could get a lot more serious than this because anger, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing Jesus talks about is the sin of anger. And this particular author that I'm quoting here said, in the cauldron of anger and contempt, and, and one of the things he said is, what, what would the world be like? How many murders have been committed due to anger? What do you think? More than 50%? Sure, of course, right? But if that person would have been able to control their anger, would that murder have happened? Probably not. So that's a cauldron of anger and contempt. The primacy of anger and the order of evil, he's saying that's number one. If we could get a grip on our anger, if we could control our spirit, that will take us a long way into keeping that evil twin in the cage. You're not letting him out. He could be shaking the cage. You're like, no, no, I've been there. I know what it's like to let you out. You can't come out. Uh, I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, and one of the fruit of the Spirit is self. 
A little louder, please. Self-control. My evil twin does not get to come out and play. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, long ago, God instructed Moses to tell the people, don't murder. Those who murder will be judged and punished. But here is the even harder truth, it says in the voice. Here is even the harder truth. Anyone who's angry with his brother will be judged for his anger. <laughs> Sermon on the Mount. This, you know, take it as gospel. Wow. Anyone who taunts his friends and calls him a loser or a fool will have to answer to the high court. And anyone who calls his brother a fool may find himself in the fires of hell. Well, you're meaner than Moses, Jesus. I thought if I killed somebody, but now you're saying like, no, this is way too hard. Well, look, he's just trying to warn us that this is what pulls us away from God. Holding people in contempt. Making less of them, even though God says, this is my creation, but I judge them as less than me. Let that one sink in for a minute. How many have an inner Archie Bunker that pops its head up every once in a while? The young people are all like, what's he talking about? Yeah, well, that's that evil twin that has judged whole races of people. Not Jesus. That's not the Lord. Amen? So how about this one? Get off my back. Stop telling me what to do. My body, my choice. Well, you know, you can think of a million things, right? But in Proverbs 25, it says, he that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So if you had a city back in the days this was written, if you had no protection, you're going to be taken into slavery yourself. You're going to be captured by whatever the next raiding army is going to be. You had to have protection. But if you can't rule your spirit, he's telling us this is key to life. If you are getting emotionally hijacked on a regular basis, the enemy's going to have his way with you. You've got to learn how to keep control of this thing, and you can't do it in your own strength, but the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Fasting, you're not going to die if you miss a meal, I promise, even though your flesh will tell you that. Proverbs 16, 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit, you could argue, better than he that takes a city. This is just wisdom, isn't it? And then in another translation of the text verse, it says, this is also the voice, you draw light into your body through your eyes and light shines out into the world through your eyes. So if your eye is well and shows you what is true, then your whole body will be filled with the light. But if your eye is clouded or evil, then your body will be filled with evil and dark clouds. Ooh, this is really profound, I think, the way they put this one. And the darkness that takes over the body of a child of God who has gone astray that is the deepest, darkest darkness that there is. Now, why would that be? Because you already know the truth. And if you're backsliding, you have something to compare it against. And now you want to run faster and you want a bigger mask. Because before you knew the Lord, your conscience was seared with a hot iron. But once you got saved, now the depth of the knowledge of the sin. And I hope this doesn't come across as being condemning. I started by saying, my evil twin, right? None of us get to the point where that thing is completely conquered. That's why we need the Lord every day. Deliver us from evil. That's the Lord's prayer. Say it every day. Deliver me from the evil that's going to try to attack me and lower my effectiveness for you. I want to be a meat-eating Christian, not a milk-drinking Christian. How about you? All right, so how about Newcomb? <laughs> this is a very specific New Jersey term. It's not just put him in jail. I'm pressing the button for the nuclear bomb against my enemy. But the, the disciples said it. Luke 9, 54, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? It's in the Bible. Can't we do that one, Lord, please? About the Samaritans. But he turned and rebuked them. He said, you don't know what spirit, what manner of spirit that you're of. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Republicans? Democrats? Really? Nothing good can come from them. <laughs> oh, boy. hope he changes the subject soon. <laughs> and then in Galatians, Paul says, 
It's clear that our flesh entices us into practicing some of the flesh's most heinous acts. Corrupt sexual relationships, impurity, unbridled lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, arguing, jealousy, anger. I didn't even give you the whole list. It's like, enough. I, I get it, okay? None of that is good fruit. None of that is good fruit. And if we keep our attention on those things, if we keep our attention on the things that are pulling us away from God, our immune system to sin gets weak. And we fall into it. And the people we hang out with really matter too, don't they? Because there's that collective captivity. And if you're with a bunch of serious Christians, that's really good. Because we're willing to talk to each other and just hold each other accountable and say, I don't know if you should do that. That, that looks like a mistake to me. I know you didn't ask me my opinion. But two years ago, in a weak moment, you said I could speak into your life. So I'm doing that. I'm speaking into your life. We do a lot of counseling. And, you know, this is a common thing. We just have these blind spots when we're talking to people. Just by sitting down with a couple of people that know the Lord, you have a normal, civilized conversation. On your own, you get into a fight, and all of a sudden, you can't get two seconds into the conversation, and the volume is, is at 45 no, just sit down with people who love you and say, maybe we can think of it through this lens, right? What's the harm in that? It's not, it doesn't even cost anything. And all these things he lists, and other shameful vices that plague humanity. Reading the Bible is not a vice. <laughs> That's a good thing to do. Now, if you're reading it without the Holy Spirit, it could become a hammer. So it's the letter with, without the Spirit can kill people. So it's got to be this combination of both, right? He's seeking those who will worship him how? Spirit and in truth. So reading the Bible is good, but got to have that oil of the Holy Spirit there or else it becomes another nuclear bomb to blow people up for all their sin. I told you this clearly and I tell you again so there's no confusion. Those who give in to the ways of producing bad fruit, all these things he's listing here are bad fruit will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then the good news is, in verse 22, the Holy Spirit produces good fruit. Anybody know that to be true? I'm trying to get somebody to smile in here. Unconditional love. Oh, that's a good one. Joy, patience, peace, kind-heartedness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. I'm sorry, gentleness and self-control. For me personally, it would have helped me if self-control was a little closer to the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> I like the joy and the peace part. That's great. But self-control, man, that's a hard one, isn't it? To know you're supposed to do something is not the same as doing it. How many got a gym membership? Jackie Mason said when they sell you those um, home-based elliptical machines, they should put a coat hanger right on it because you're going to just use it for a coat hanger in your bedroom anyway. <laughs> just kind of cut right to the chase, you know. You won't find any law opposed to good fruit. Those of us who belong to the anointed one have crucified our old lives and put to death the flesh and all the lusts and desires that plague us. That's really hard to do. You guys got something going down there. I like this. <laughs> That's really hard to do, to put your flesh to death. But this is core to Christianity Paul, that's what Paul said. It's one of the first verses in the Navigators, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, you know this one? I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. So even though I don't always feel like I have the same level of faithfulness, he does. And if he's my goal, and every day I become more like Christ, and I'm being transformed into that image, then I've got a much better chance of living a flourishing life. Yes, the road that leads to life is narrow. The other options lead to destruction, but I'm gonna keep looking for that narrow road. That's how I wake up every morning thinking, I wanna be all that you made me to be, Lord, not what my mask is telling me that I have to be. So since we have chosen to walk with the Spirit, that's a pretty important word, isn't it? You have to choose to walk with the Spirit, because your flesh is just always waiting to be the co-pilot in your plane. No, I'm going to choose to let Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the Father and Jesus as my model, that is who I'm looking to here. I'm going to walk with them. Let's keep each step in perfect sync with God's Spirit. That's good wording right there. 
You want a goal in the morning? I choose to walk with you, and I want to be in perfect sync with everything you're telling me to do today. Don't let me become distracted and get my eyes off of the prize. I'm pressing towards the mark of the prize for the high calling that you have for me with no mask. That'll happen when we set aside our self-interest and work together. This is to the church. We work together. You don't realize how valuable the people are that are sitting all around you. I don't think we need each other. I do think we need each other. We, we undervalue how important it is to be with other believers. Set aside our self-interest work together to create true community instead of a culture consumed by provocation and pride and envy. And this can happen in the church, right? There can be an unhealthy community being formed if we're all trying to get a leg up on somebody else. And, you know, that inner Tanya Harding is waiting out in the parking lot to take somebody out. <laughs> we, we have a deliverance ministry if, that's, if you got triggered by that. This is what C.S. Lewis said. Every time you make a choice, you're turning the central part of you, I'll call it your soul, the part of you that chooses. Every time you make a choice, you're turning that central part of you into something a little different than it was before. All your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature. Who does this guy think he is telling me that? Well, pretty smart guy. Had a lot of influence. I think it's great. There's only two choices. I'm either getting closer to God or I'm getting farther away. And if I think I'm in neutral, I'm going backwards. That's what I found. I'm into a creature that's in harmony with God or else one that's in a state of war and hatred against God. Each of us at each moment is progressing either to harmony with God or hatred of God. All right, you take it up with C.S. Lewis if you don't like it, but. Who is in your community, this is back to James now, is understanding and wise. Who in your community is understanding and wise? It's not the con artist. Talented. The con artists are really talented. But let's, let's go to godly wisdom. Let's surround ourselves with people with godly character because that's who I want to be close to. That, they're going to give me the right advice. He says, let the example of that person that you look up to, which is marked by wisdom and gentleness, blaze a trail for everybody else. See so why we need each other? And if we, if we just had an open forum here, you have so much collective knowledge in this room of how to live this out, right? Well, how come the Bible doesn't talk about LSD? So maybe I should do it because it's not mentioned in the Bible. No, I can help you on that one. Don't do it. Bad idea. If your heart is one that bleeds dark streams of jealousy and selfishness, oh, who is this guy? It's the Lord's brother. Don't be so proud that you ignore your depraved state. You get it? So we could get caught up on the worship team and feel threatened because some other musician is a better player than I am or whatever. However you want to do this, it's not, you're not immune to this just because you're in church. We've got to be pushing towards the mark of, of his prize, right? So what do you do when the light in you is darkness? Deal with it. Just honestly look around and say, well, there's a bunch of other people here that are willing to admit that they're doing the same thing. So how do we grow together? Well, you grow together way better than you try to grow alone. And I'm going to just try to tell you that privacy and confidentiality is the highest mark for, for this kind of thing because if you talk to us about something, we're not going to tell anybody. You've got to trust us, right? Because that would just blow the whole thing wide open. That, that if you say something in a meeting, it's going to be held in secret between those people that are there. Nothing gets shared because how else can we be effective in trying to help people? Right? You've, you've got to trust that, that that's part of this process. And by the way, the people that are on the side of the desk that are trying to help you all have the same kind of issues that they had to deal with too. Okay, nobody here is above anybody else. We're all working our way towards being more like Jesus every day. I'm just going to go a little faster just because um, I want to get to another example. And this was Moses, right? It says, <laughs> this is the King James Version. I don't quote it a lot, but once in a while they got some real on point ways they used to say things in the old days. All right, so people are complaining to Moses, and it displeased the Lord, and his anger was kindled. 
So Trisha did a message before we went to Israel back in 2019. We took a, a group of people to Israel. And she said, go on a fast of negative words. See how long you can go without speaking a negative word. <laughs> what did you say, a week at the time? Try going a week. So we go to Israel, and the people that were with us didn't all hear that message. <laughs> they were from a different church. And, man, every time something came up that was a little bit of a problem, I'm like, you need to hear her message. This is really valuable. <laughs> Fast from complaining. See how long you can go. Oh, it's amazing how quick we are to complain. And there's nothing good about it in the Bible, right? I mean, it says the Lord was not happy. It displeased the Lord. Instead of focusing on what we do have, we can only just focus on the thing we don't have. But you forget it. There's always going to be somebody with more than you. How about be grateful? Be grateful. You're alive. You're vertical. You're not horizontal. You're not in a hospital. That's a good place to start. It displeased the Lord, and his anger was kindled. The fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire was quenched. Thank you, Moses. Uh, this is a line I like. The mixed multitude among them fell a lusting. <laughs> you know what he's talking about? It's when, you're, it's when your flesh just gets the best of you. And you think you're going to only have one fig newton. And you're th three sleeves through the whole box. A quart of cold milk. You just threw every piece of self-control out the window. You fell a lusting. Oreos? Oh, my God. No. haagen mm. Chubby Hubby is actually one of the flavors. Oh, man. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord! <laughs> the children of Israel wept again. Who shall give us meat to eat? We're sick of this manna. Who's going to give us meat to eat? So, I'm a victim. I got miraculous food coming every day from heaven, but I'm a victim because I didn't get new shoes. Oh, Gregory got that one too. Moses heard the whining and started whining himself. Do you notice how that works? Whining is contagious. He heard the whining and said to God, why are you treating me this way? They keep crying, give us me, give us me. Probably not like that either. If this is how you intend to treat me, kill me. This is the same guy that just prayed that he wouldn't kill the rest of them. Man, it's contagious. Complaining and whining is contagious. And God says, oh, so do you think I can't take care of you? So God sends a wind set in motion and swept the quails from the sea. And they piled up three feet deep in the camp as far out as a day's walk in every direction. And this is better than fig newtons for these people. But you think they're just going to have one? Mm -mm. While they were still chewing the quail, God's anger blazed out against them, and they were buried at a place called the Graves of the Craving. Well, I thought you said this was good news. <laughs> well, look, I'm just trying to expose what the enemy tries to do to us, okay? He tries to keep our minds on the level things here at the earth, and God says, keep your mind set on things above. You're going to notice that sometimes the light in you is darkness, and instead of running from it, just deal with it. You can handle the truth with Jesus. Remember that scene from the movie? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Well, yeah, we can. We can handle the truth because we're with a bunch of people that are trying to be honest. God gave you the spirit of truth. That's what he calls the Holy Spirit. So if you see darkness, don't run from it. Let's deal with it together as a tribe. Ephesians 4, they've lost all natural feelings. These are people that don't know the Lord. And they've given themselves over to sensual, greedy, and reckless living. They stop at nothing to satisfy their impure appetites. So, again, like, when you see somebody in that condition, remember that you used to be that way. And whatever the Lord has done to help you, help them. Just talk to them and say, you don't have to do this. You don't have to live like this, addicted to drugs or whatever it was. Take off your former way of life, your crumpled old self, that dark soul corrupted by deceitful desire and lust, to take a fresh breath and let God renew your attitude and spirit. Can we stand because I, I, want, I want this to be our prayer. And, and if you just lift your hand, say, Lord, I want to get above my circumstances. I want to get above the things that have been occupying my mind, the relationships that I've been grinding over. 
I need peace in my life. I need the peace of God to rule in, and reign in my spirit. That's what your word says, that, that you give us the ability, even in the midst of all the weaknesses that we can show, your spirit inside of us allows us to monitor these things. So we don't want to hide anything from you, Lord. We want to be able to be open and, and just bring these things before you and our brothers and sisters as well, the mature people that we know we can trust, to be able to say, I've been dealing with this thing for a while, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of this stronghold. The enemy has had a stronghold in my life. And I'll just take you to one more verse at the end here. I want to end um, right here. In 1 Peter chapter 2, when it comes to purging darkness from our souls, this is, this is one of the ones that really helped me because Jesus, if anybody could have said, I'm a victim, it was him. He didn't say that, did he? No, he said, I'm an offering. And we were talking about earlier today about how Mary broke open that alabaster box. That was you, Lisa, right? And, you know, there's something really very symbolic about that because the reason they would keep that alabaster box is so when somebody died, they would perfume the dead body and they would cover up the smell of the decomposing body. That's not a pleasant thought, is it? So she's doing that in advance. But the other thing is in the tabernacle, they would bring incense to put on the fire and when that incense would burn it would become a sweet offering to the father so here's jesus who's about to defeat death and that perfume is coming over him and it's not so much about death it's about the offering he's making to the lord of his own body is being consumed and is a sweet smell to the father so as we do this as we purge the darkness from our souls that in itself is an offering and, you know, in Philippians it says, I want to share in your sufferings so that I might know the power of your resurrection. Suffering is just bringing that thing to the cross and saying, I don't need this anymore. It might cost me a friendship or two. I get that. But I'm willing to walk away for you. Because I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me. I know you knew that one. You can have the whole world, but I'll take Jesus. Remember that verse? So this is Jesus. This is the example that we have. When he was reviled, when he was insulted is another word for that. When he was disparaged, he did not return in kind. When he was slapped, he didn't slap back. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. But what did he do? Do this with me, all right? He committed himself to him who judges right righteously. So here's the deal. The devil's constantly putting lures out there in front of you to get you to take the bait. So whatever the original thing is, if you react the wrong way, that becomes the new thing. It's not the topic that you were thinking about. It's the way you responded inappropriately. Here's the thing. Don't take the bait. Don't fall for that lie of the enemy. It's a, it's a lie. So he commits himself to his father, who he knows will judge righteously, it says, he bore our sins on, in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might, be, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes, say it, I am healed. By whose stripes I am healed. Lord, we thank you, not just physically from, from infirmity, but our hearts have been healed. We've been able to forgive ourselves and forgive other people because of what you did and the model that you set for us, Lord. We want to live this life excited about how you're going to use us for the kingdom, not just to think about heaven and dying and going to heaven, but now, while we're here, to be powerful, effective people for you, for the kingdom. And it says, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Lord, everyone here at King of Kings, anybody that's watching today, I pray that you make this real to us. There is going to be times when we see darkness is the light inside of us, and we don't like it. But you have equipped us. You have given us everything that we need to overcome darkness. And instead of seeing it as a negative, Lord, we'll say that's one more thing that I can bring to the cross. That's one more chaff that can be burned off. That's more impurities that the fire is bringing up to the surface, that we can release it, and it would be an offering to you. And then we look more like Jesus tomorrow than we do today. Because that's our goal, is to be transformed into your image, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.